Good morning. This is not, again, how I wanted to meet you all, but we may be doing this for quite a few more weeks. At this time, we're probably a little bit short-tempered, a little bit maybe impatient with all that's taking place. Our way of life has been interrupted. But remember, we studied in the book of James, chapter 1, when James said to his readers, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter trials of various kinds. Remember, we said the joy is in the same family of Greek words as grace. So because of the grace of God, we can look at our life and say God's in control. And he said, what is the purpose of the trials? That you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So what that means is, what's God teaching me as a Christian? What is perfect and complete? Maybe greater love for God, greater love and patience for your spouse and for your children if you're all cooped up all day. Be greater love for the fellowship of the church where we get more involved, want to do different things. So God teaches us a lot through these trials. So I hope to, every week until we come together again, at least have a worship service for us to worship together at home so that we can glorify God together as a church family. Jesus said, I've said these things to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. The Lord be with you and also with you. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You're good and do good. Teach me your statutes. It's for good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you we can gather together this Sunday morning and to worship you. Thank you for technology that makes it possible for us to be together. We thank you for Jesus who holds our life in his hands, who died for us and eternally loves us. And we thank you that in any trial that we face, that you are with us, you are our shield, our defender, you uphold us by your mighty hand. So we pray you'd bless us in our worship, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Our Old Testament reading comes from 2 Kings chapter 19. The background is that Hezekiah is king of Israel. He became, or scarred Judah, he became king at 12 years old. His father Ahab was a wicked king. Hezekiah is a good king. Now the nation of Assyria had overcome the northern kingdom in 722 BC. They're now surrounding and about to overcome the southern kingdom. Naturally, Hezekiah is worried. Isaiah the prophet tells Hezekiah to trust in God, to pray to him. So we read in 2 Kings 19, 14, Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers, that is, some of Sennacheriah's messengers, and read it. Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord that he was going to be invaded. Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You've made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear, open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste, the nations and their lands have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us, please, from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. So we pray through the coronavirus that God would show his mighty hand, defeat this virus, and bring back stability to our land. But then we read in verse 32, Therefore thus says the Lord God concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city or shoot an arrow there or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same he shall return. He shall not come into this city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake, for the sake of my servant David. And this is fascinating. That night the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. When the people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. They were surrounding the nation of, of excuse, the city of Jerusalem. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed, went home, and lived at Nineveh. And as he was worshiping in the house of Nishrash, his god, at Ramalek and Sherezar, his sons struck him down with a sword and escaped into the land of Ararat. 
and Esradon his son reigned in his place. There again, God answered prayer. Hezekiah laid it out before God, trusted him to take care of his people. God did it, and God will do the same thing for us. Our responsive reading comes from John 14, 23. Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Again, Jesus is reminding us the help of the Spirit comes to comfort us in times of trial, in times of uh, anxiety in our life, because he dearly loves us. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again this Sunday morning we can come and worship you as your covenant people. We would long to be physically together, but thank you we can be together through modern technology, to thank you for being God, to thank you for loving us, to thank you for caring about us. And we are anxious about the uh, coronavirus. We do not know what the end result will be. We just pray that you not only keep us safe, but that you would keep our nation safe and bring many, many people in our country to know and love Jesus through a hard time, to realize how helpless we are without the hand of God, for our president, for our Congress to make wise decisions as they govern us. And we thank you, God, that we do not look to them alone for answers. We look to you, for you're the one who gives wisdom to men to come up with a, a vaccine to solve this virus. So we thank you, God. Just remind us again that you're in control. When we become anxious and fretful, let us remind ourselves again, the Lord God sits in heaven, that you alone watch over us, care for us, deeply love us. We pray today for ourselves, for just a greater awareness of your love for us. Give us patience, we pray, if we're in our homes for a long period of time. We pray for our church family. We just thank you for one another. Pray you keep all of us safe. We pray for our witness in our community, that through this time, people would see the peace of Jesus Christ in us. We pray, God, for your just preservation of us as your beloved children. So we thank you, God. We come before you with one heart and one mind, thanking you for your goodness, never forgetting to praise you because you are good. So we pray and rest our minds, rest our minds on you to remember that Jesus alone is the anchor of our life. Thank you, God, for the gift of your beloved Son. And we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples a model of prayer when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our assurance of pardon comes from Joel chapter 2. Yet even now declares the Lord, Return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he's gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. So we pray, use this trial to bring us closer to you. Christian, what do you believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance but the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory 
to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Again, crowning Jesus Christ as the Son of God who died for us, rose again victorious and is seated at the Father's right hand. Our scripture reading this morning is rather long, so I'm glad that you don't have to stand up and listen to it, but it is 2 Chronicles chapter 6. And the only way to give you the idea of what we're talking about is just to read the chapter for you. And again, it is a long chapter. But I begin at chapter 5, verse 13. So let us hear together God's infallible word. It was the duty of the trumpeters and singers to make themselves heard in unison in praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. And when the song was raised with trumpets and cymbals and other musical instruments in praise to the Lord, for he is good, for steadfast love endures forever. The house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness, but I built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. Then the king turned around and blessed all the assembly of Israel, while all the assembly of Israel stood. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to David my father, saying, Since the day that I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a house, that my name might be there. And I chose no man as prince over my people Israel, but I've chosen Jerusalem, that my name may be there. And I've chosen David to be over my people Israel. Now it was in the heart of David my father to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to David my father, Whereas it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, it is not you who shall build the house, but your son who shall be born to you shall build the house for my name. Now the Lord has fulfilled his promise that he made. For I have risen in the place of David my father and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. And I built the house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. And there I've set the ark in which is the covenant of the Lord that he made with the people of Israel. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands. Solomon had made a bronze platform five cubits long, five cubits wide, three cubits high, and set it in the court, and he stood on it. Then he knelt on his knees in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven and said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or on earth, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart, who have kept with your servant David my father what you have declared to him. You spoke with your mouth, with your hand have fulfilled and filled it this day. Now therefore, O Lord God of Israel, keep for your servant David my father what you promised him, saying, You shall not lack a man to sit before me on the throne of Israel. If only your sons pay close attention to their way, to walk in my law as you've walked before me. Now therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you have spoken to your servant David. But will God indeed dwell with man on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. You have regarded the prayer of your servant and to his plea, O oh Lord my God, listening to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you, that your eyes may be opened day and night toward this house, the place where you have promised to set your name, that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers toward this place. And listen to the pleas of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. And listen from heaven, your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. If a man sins against his neighbor, and is made to take an oath, and comes and swears his oath before your altar in this house. Then hear from heaven, and act and judge your servants, repaying the guilty by bringing his conduct on his own head. 
and vindicating the righteous by rewarding him according to his righteousness. If your people Israel are defeated before the enemy because they've sinned against you, and they turn again and acknowledge your name and pray and plead with you in this house, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them again to the land that you gave to them and to their fathers. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they've sinned against you, if they pray toward this place and acknowledge your name and turn from their sin when you afflict them, then here in heaven forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel, when you teach them the good way in which they should walk and grant rain upon your land which you've given to your people as an inheritance. If there's famine in the land, if there's pestilence or blight or mildew or locust or caterpillar, if their enemies besiege them in the land at their gates, whatever plague, whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer, whatever plea is made by any man or by all your people Israel, each knowing his own affliction and his own sorrow and stretching out his hand toward this house, then hear from heaven your dwelling place and forgive and render to each whose heart you know according to all his ways. For you, you only know the hearts of the children of mankind, that they may fear you and walk in your ways all the days that they live in the land that you gave to our fathers. Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a far country for the sake of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when he comes and prays toward this house, hear from heaven your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this house that I have built is called by your name. If your people go out to battle against their enemies, by whatever way you shall send them, and they pray to you toward this city that you have chosen, and the house that I built for your name, then hear from heaven their prayer and their plea, and maintain their cause." If they sin against you, for there's no one who does not sin, and you are angry with them and give them to an enemy so that they are carried away captive to a land far or near, yet if they turn their heart in the land to which they have been carried captive and repent and plead with you in the land of their captivity, saying, We have sinned and have acted perversely and wickedly. If they repent with all their heart and all their soul in the land of their captivity to which they were carried captive, and pray toward their land which you gave to their fathers, and the city that you've chosen, and the house that I built for your name. Then hear from heaven your dwelling place, their prayer and their pleas, and maintain their cause, and forgive your people who sinned against you. Now, O oh my God, let your eyes be open, your ears attentive to the prayer of this place. And now arise, O oh Lord God, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might, let your priest, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation. Let your saints rejoice in your goodness. O Lord God, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. Remember your steadfast love for your servant David. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Two points as you see in your sermon outline. The first is passionate worship. And the second thing would be petitions. Now as Solomon began to pray, his opening words bore the impact of what the people had seen. The Lord had given them the same privileges Moses received at the outset of the nation's journey from Sinai to the Promised Land. We read that in Exodus chapter 40. And to assure the people of his presence, a cloud hovered over the tabernacle during the day and changed to a pillar of fire at night. Now to assure the people of his acceptance of the temple that Solomon built, the Lord of glory was seen to have taken up residence in the temple. It's kind of a remarkable act of condescension on the part of God. Same thing he did when he sent his son Jesus to come down and to die for us. The local church is not the counterpart of the Old Testament temple, but we are, as the people of God, that God fills us with his spirit. Ephesians 5, 20 to 22, Paul said, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you, that is us, are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So God indwells us by his Spirit. We're thankful we are a family of God. The second century church father Irenaeus said, 
The glory of God is a living name, and the life of man consists in beholding God. How this happens is a testament to God's grace. At the Shekinah came down on the temple and took possession of it, so it is that at the time we accept the Lord Jesus as our Savior, God the Holy Spirit comes and indwells us. What a neat thought that is. So while overwhelmed at God's condescension, Solomon realized that this was in fulfillment of his expressed desire to live in the midst of his people. Now this is significant. The Lord of glory desires to be the center of your life and my life. So if you look at verse 12, Solomon now turned and faced the altar. Kneeling down, he raises his arms toward heaven. In preparation for this event, he made a bronze platform. He set it in the middle of the court. Solomon stood on this platform, and in the sight of all the people, he knelt down and he prayed. So he asked, why face the altar? Why not continue to face the temple where God so recently took up residence? Well, the altar was the place of sacrifice. And Solomon's actions remind all of us that the only basis of true worship is the death of Jesus Christ. The altar reminds us that we're to present ourselves to God as living sacrifices, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Then with the assurance of our acceptance, we offer to God our prayers and pray that he will hear us. So we say, as the people of God, we come to you in repentance. Thank you, God, for hearing our prayers. You know, in every age, it's important for us as God's people to come together for fellowship with each other and draw near to God. So I said, we're doing it today in the comforts of our home. But today, there's not one special place where God's appointed as a sanctuary to hold believers together. And aren't we thankful for that? We don't have to be in this place to worship God. He appointed his son as the sanctuary for his people. And wherever his truth is preached, we his people are drawn together in true gospel unity. And being together as God's people focuses our attention on God our Savior. Hebrews 10, 25, let us not give up meeting together as is the habit of some, but let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. In the meantime, we encourage each other through phone calls and emails. How are you doing? How can I pray for you? Reminding you that the best is yet to come, not on earth, but in heaven. And to say, thank you, God, for dwelling in us, reminding us of how good you are. Verse 13, he spreads out his outstretched hands toward heaven. That's an acknowledgement of need. In holding out his open hands toward heaven, he's drawing the people's thoughts beyond the temple. His focus on God who dwells in heaven. So here again, it's a prayer to God. R.C. Sproul describes secularism as the belief that what matters is now and only now. All access to the above and beyond is blocked. There is no exit from the confines of this present world. What a bleak thought that is, to think this is all there is, nothing more to hope in. Solomon is telling us there's a lot more for us to hope in. It is God in heaven. Solomon's prayer, the action that accompany his prayer, is the antidote to secularism. His whole heart is devoted to the above and beyond. The above and beyond. Thank you, God. Solomon really did expect God in heaven to hear his prayer and act in response to it. Eight times he says, hear from heaven and act. We see it the first time in verse 23. Prayer requires a heavenly mindset, an awareness of eternal realities that transcend time and space. In prayer, we enjoy fellowship with God who's eternal and infinite. In prayer, we come to God day by day asking him to guide our life, to take care of us. We come expectantly praying. So Solomon holding up his hand shows he's waiting for an answer from God in heaven. So we ask God, please cure uh, our nation of this coronavirus. Please, oh God, keep my family safe. Please, oh God, preserve people's jobs, many losing their livelihood. Take care of our first responders who put their life on the line to keep us healthy. 
Oh God, hear from heaven our prayer. We thank you that as your church, we can pray for our nation, pray for the world to see the glories of our God. <clears throat> so if you look at verse 14, he said, O oh Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or on earth. What he's saying is this, no other God's able to hear and answer prayer. The Hebrew Bible uses an interesting word to describe the heathen gods. The word is hebel, H-E-B-E-L. It means mist or vapor. It describes something that appears to exist, but which upon closer examination disappears as rapidly as the morning dew. These gods are nothing more than a figment of people's imaginations. Isaiah 44, 18, we read, they know nothing, talking about idols. They understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see, and their minds closed so they cannot understand. Elijah taunted the prophets of Baal as they danced around his altar on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18. But their prayers elicited no response. So Elijah said in verse 27, maybe he's in deep thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. The God of Israel is unique because he's able to hear and see and answer the prayers of his people. Aren't we thankful we don't look to government to solve our problems or just people to solve? We look to God alone to solve our problems. God hears us. Nothing else will satisfy. And I've told you that many, many times. We can look to something on earth to satisfy. It never, ever will. So there's no God like you in heaven or on earth for our worship of the Lord to be truly biblical, we must allow the uniqueness of God's person and work to kind of fill our minds. So Solomon reminds us that our God is unique. There's no one and nothing that compares with him. And this includes things on earth as well as in heaven. Such a realization of God's greatness and his wisdom and his majesty should what? Fill us with awe. He's faithful and perform everything he promised. We see that in verses 14 and 15. But think about that. He's faithful and he will perform everything he has promised. Now look at verse 18. He begins with a rhetorical question. But will God indeed dwell with mankind on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I built? If we would understand what prayer really is, we need to understand who God is and what God is like. The highest heaven cannot contain him. Well, does this mean that God is far away? Does this mean that he cannot hear us or is disinterested in us? Not at all. God can hear the prayers of every person in the world. You know, that's kind of hard to comprehend, God hearing everybody's prayer. In Solomon's time, he also dwelt on earth in the temple. Well, he dwells inside of us as his covenant people. But some of those in the assembly may have doubted God's answering prayer. Maybe sometime we wonder, does he really hear and answer my prayers? Verse 18, will God indeed dwell with man on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I built? Again, will the great God of heaven really come to dwell in this temple and hear our prayers. Will he dwell with us and hear our prayers? The magnificence, again, is he doesn't dwell in a building, he dwells inside of us. Listen to what the psalmist said, Psalm 145, beginning at verse 18. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him but the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. And that's what we want to do, bless his holy name. So look at verse 21. Listen to the pleas of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place and listen from heaven, your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. What's he telling us? When God hears the prayers of his people, you and me, he's moved to respond to them. We talked about this in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 
Is it his will to cure the coronavirus? I believe it is. I don't know when. I believe that God's going to teach us something through it, but I believe he will take it away. But notice something else. He hears the prayers of his people the same way that a mother hears the prayers of her infant children. When our children were small and they were in the next room, if they cried during the night, in the morning I would ask Molly, did you sleep last night? No, I didn't sleep. The baby cried all night. Why didn't you get up? I didn't hear the baby. Oh, yes, you did. No, I didn't. I really believe that you moms have a sixth sense we dads don't have. Not excuse. I never heard the baby cry. That's the truth. Never did. But that's how God is with us. He hears your cry over everything else in this world. All the clamor in the world, he hears your cry and my cry. When Israel was enslaved in Egypt, Exodus 3, verse 7, God said, I heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I'm concerned about their suffering. I've come down to rescue them. Isn't that what we're praying now? Rescue us? This is new territory for us as a nation. And it is a frightful experience. What's going to happen? There again, we trust in God, do we not? God listens to the prayer of a broken, contrite heart. And that's who we are. Say, God, I come before you and acknowledge through all of this. See how helpless we are. You are God. Must include a confession of sin, too. Look at verse 36. There's no one who does not sin. Many of the situations Solomon would go on to mention in the rest of his prayer were instances of disaster following as a result of sin. But when God's people acknowledged their sin, they found God to be forgiving. Now, the Hebrew word which the author of First Chronicles uses to describe God's forgiveness is the Hebrew word salah, S-A-L-A-H. In the Old Testament, it's used only with reference to God's pardon for sinners. In Exodus 39, 34.9 and Numbers 14, 19 and 20, it describes how God acted in two of the darkest moments of Israel's history. The heart of the gospel is that the same gracious God will forgive us when we come to him in contrition. Isaiah 55, 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord. He will have mercy on him to our God. He will freely pardon. Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? None of us. With you there's forgiveness, therefore you are feared. As a result, Solomon could pray that God would hear and forgive. So from this, Solomon immediately launched into describing the kinds of situations in which prayer might be offered. Verses 22 to 40. No matter what the situation he faced, we faced. He asked God to incline his ear, hear the prayers of his people, forgive their sins, and to help them. He listed seven different scenarios, each one describing a situation where prayers could be made. So the same thing is with us. We come before God. We've had this coronavirus. Please, God, we implore you, take it away. But here there are seven different petitions. The second point of the sermon today that are prayed by Solomon. Let's look at them. First of all, to validate an oath that someone might swear on behalf of his innocence in a criminal case, verses 22 and 23. Second, to redeem the people if they were defeated by an enemy because of their sin, verses 24 and 25. To bring relief in case of drought, verses 26 and 27. To restore the land in case of an epidemic, a famine, or some other national disaster, verses 28 to 31, right where we are today. Look at verse 28. If there is famine in the land, if there is pestilence or blight or mildew or locust or caterpillar, if their enemies besiege them in land at their gates, whatever plague, whatever sickness there is. See, Solomon has in view a range of natural disasters that might follow in the wake of drought to make a bad situation worse. And here this disaster would come upon Israel. Why? because they were slow to learn from God's chastisements. Now, he may not be chastising us in particular. Maybe he is. Maybe he's teaching the whole church, not just our congregation, the American church or the worldwide church, a lesson. See, these disasters, sometimes God brings upon us because we're slow to recognize the sinfulness of our actions, a time of introspection. 
Remember Saul, the proud Pharisee, kicked for a long time against the goads in Acts 26 before he was humbled before God. Only after he lost everything by squandering his wealth in the distant country did the prodigal son come to his senses and return to his father. So what Solomon says in verse 29, each knowing his own affliction and his own sorrow. He says we spread out our hands toward the temple. We're fully aware of the sin in our life. And when we come to God, we repent. And often it's this painful experience that we go through to learn again how much we cherish God. Look at verse 31. That they may fear you and walk in your ways all the days that they live in the land you gave our fathers. In Exodus I'm sorry, Genesis 18.32, God said for the sake of ten people, ten righteous people, he would not have destroyed the city of Sodom. So maybe he's saying it begins with us, the church, that we're the pace setters. We come before God in repentance. We want our unbelieving friends to see the difference that Jesus makes in our life. So we say, please, God, take away the coronavirus. Please, God, show me how I may live more righteous in your sight. And that I learn lessons from this to trust you more and more and more. Number five, to demonstrate his greatness to any foreigner who might come to Israel to learn about God, verses 32 and 33. To support Israel in war when God sent them out on a mission, verses 34 and 35. And to redeem the people if they should repent after being brought into captivity because of their disobedience to God, verses 36 to 39. The only way to avoid God's anger is repentance. Look at verse 37, a changed heart. It's more than a change of mind. It's more than regret. It's a new way of thinking. It's a total transformation. So let's say as a church we learn this. God's teaching me more and more about my relationship to him. Maybe it's not what it should be, but this is what I want God to do in my life. So God, let's say you've given us a wake-up call. So we plead to you for mercy. We acknowledge We haven't lived the way we should. We want to renounce the sin in our life. We want you to hear our prayers and restore us again to wholeness, restore our nation. Please use the church to set the the pace. Right now, the church is going through hard times. Many want nothing to do with the church of Christ, and that's a shame. Maybe this will be different. Wouldn't it be wonderful if God used this coronavirus to bring a revival to the United States or other nations? It would be fantastic. Two lessons we learn from Solomon's prayer. First of all, God promises in, uh, encouragement to Solomon to pray. In the seven situations listed, he reminded the nation of the promises God made to Israel. God knew the needs of the people even before they brought them to him. He knows the desire of their hearts. He knows the desire of your heart and my heart. Look at verse 30. That you know, according to all his ways, you know, you only know the hearts of the children of mankind. Doesn't take away the urgency of prayer. We should always pray and never give up because the mercies of God require a covenant response from us. God's faithful to his promises when we claim them in our prayers. I beseech you, I beg you, God, to please Uh, deal with me in any way you see fit. Make me more the person you want me to be. And please, God, heal our nation. We should know or look the short but important word, if, in verse 38. Throughout the prayer, Solomon's emphasized God's mercy. God's willing to forgive sinners if we repent. To bless us if we plead repentance. An exalted view of God will always lead to fervent praying. I think you'd agree with that. This is what Spurgeon said to his congregation in London at a time of spiritual awakening. He said, every man seemed like a crusader besieging the new Jerusalem. Each one appeared determined to storm the celestial city by might of intercession. And soon the blessing came upon us in such abundance that we had not room to receive it. May the Lord find more of such prayer among his people. The second thing, our failings make prayer essential. No greater block to effective prayer than unrepentant sin. See, Solomon did not allow any room for spiritual defeatism in his thinking. Some will plead their unworthiness as an excuse for not exerting themselves in prayer before God. But look at verse 36. We find one of the great acknowledgments of our sinfulness in the Bible. But yet from that, we also see the need to be spurred on to pray to God to pray toward the holy place, pray toward heaven. 
Say, thank you, God, you never slammed the door in repentant sinner's face. So we call it the throne of grace, right? Grace is written on it. So I come before you and say, in a time of disaster, and for many people it is, we come to you and say, God, purify our life and use us as a church to see again just a change in our entire society. That would be neat if that happened. And how do we know it won't? God could do that. Verse 42. O oh Lord God, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. Remember your steadfast love for David, your servant. We find the same phrase in Isaiah 55, 3 and 4. It refers to the divine initiative of mercy to David, the chosen leader of God's people. We read, Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I've made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Nothing can diminish the importance of our faithfulness to our covenant God. Solomon took pains to call God's people to faithfulness and fervent prayer. In his letter, James reminds us of this same thing. We talked about it several weeks ago. James 5, 16. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. There again, it may be a confidant. This is what I'm struggling with. Pray with me. Pray for me. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Who knows what the end result will be? Let us say, God, through this tragedy, great blessings will come. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, even when it's hard. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, to pray in all circumstances. I, like you, I miss having us together in worship. This is hard on all of us. And I long for the day they were all back here and that we fill our church to the rafters with people who come and say, thank you, God, for taking this away. Thank you, God, for lessons taught. The initiative of grace was in the front of Solomon's mind as he prayed back in verse 6, and it's still here in verses 41 and 42. This is the truth that he left in the minds of the people of Israel as his voice just fell silent. So he leaves us to ponder one thing, the faithfulness of God. Always remember that, the faithfulness of God. Without a grasp of this truth, our prayers could seem pointless and we may want to give up praying. Don't. Remember the faithfulness of God because God is faithful to his promises. We can say our prayers and activity that could move mountains. Who knows what God can do? And so I just want us to think about that in the weeks ahead as we meet together and worship together. Think about our great God and let's pray expectantly. God, we don't know what you're going to do. Use us, you know, again, to be a witness to other people. It may be a first responder. It may be somebody in the grocery store who's there to serve us. It could be any place. And may they see the light of Jesus in us and to say, let it start with us to be repentant, to pray, to be a witness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the words of Solomon, just reminding us of what an awesome, faithful God you are. And may we come to you in repentance. May we come to you for strength. May we come to you asking you to use us, use our church as a, as a force in our community to point people to the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Now may the Lord Jesus Christ go before you to lead you and to guide you. May it be above you to watch over you, beside you to befriend you, within you to give you peace, now and forevermore. God bless you all.